Foundation, getting this a day early. We're going to talk uh, to R.C. Fisher about uh, some props. We're going to talk about a couple of futures bets uh, and then get into some thoughts for week four betting for sides, whether it's betting or contests. Uh, I'm Chris Bellello, host of Bet the Close, uh, along with R.C. Fisher. So, R.C., you said you're going to throw some props my way and get my reaction. I have to say, before you do that, Two weeks in a row now, I've had prop bets on players that have gotten hurt. So the first week it was um, Cooper Cup, and then last week it was Adam Thielen. Fortunately, he squeezed that touchdown to get me a touchdown bet, but lost everything else. So just know, I think you're going to be coming at me with overs, and I'm not going to be so easily uh, shaking, nodding my head yes after the back-to-back injuries that I've suffered. Well, you got that stink on me because... I went heavy Austin Eckler receiving yards over, which has been my best play for the last two weeks. On Monday Night Football, I bet every prop there was for Austin Eckler for over, I think his over-under was like 18 yards receiving. So I did the I did the basic over. I did the plus to 20 and over, 25 and over, 30 and over, 40 and over, 50 and over, 60 and over. I mean, the odds were just jumping. But then there was also a first quarter, five yards or more receiving, 10, 15, 20. The 20 was like plus 1,200, plus 1,500. So I bet every single one of them uh, for the first quarter and for the game. And, of course, he came out with a 20-yard screen pass. Like, I cleaned up right off the bat, and I'm like, this is going to be the greatest night ever. Then, of course, he gets hurt, and I lose all of the big upside props that was just sitting there for me to knock down. But at the same time, I'm watching all that happen. I saw uh, in the Buffalo game the Jacksonville slot corner. um, They're starting slot corners out. Their backup slot corner a rookie uh, was in, and he got hurt in game. So I rushed out and and bet all the um, 75 and over, 100 and over, 120, I think, and over for Khalil Shakir. He had already booked a couple of catches before that, and I'm like, oh, Khalil, this is on with Khalil Shakir. And then I think he got hurt. He got hit um, wrong, and that game got to be a blowout, and then I lost the upsides on Khalil Shakir. So, I'm also cursing players to injury, so I will I might not be shaking my head at my own prop bets. Well, I, I gotta say, just at a, a high level, I really do like laddering those props and taking them all the way up. I mentioned a couple of ones that I had my heart broken on. One that I did hit is I laddered Derrick Henry all the way up to 150 rushing yards. Yeah. Uh, and I had a big uh, bet on uh, hit over carries. So, you know, for the for bet the close, the show I recorded, and I, I can't get all of the props out, but I know we're thinking about and working on a way to kind of release things because if something hits you on a Saturday, what do I do? I don't like Twitter. I'd like to have a different. So we'll, we're, we're working on that. But it is one of those things that just for the audience, I do like ladder. If you find someone you like laddering it up and I had Adam Thielen for two touchdowns and three touchdowns. And that's why I was like, you know, like Rocky went down and you're just hoping he would get up and he wasn't getting up. <laughs> Uh, I've got two ladder situations, but well, and but I'll start with the the easy one of the week. I think first, and and you can ladder it a little bit, and that's Braylon Allen and ten and a half yards receiving over uh, is the over under. But then he also has a stair step to twenty five plus uh, yards receiving, and the the key is the receiving side of it. Yes. Uh, Brees Hall is the starter. Brees Hall's getting 65-70% of the work. But the way that Brees Hall is getting his work, a lot of it is off the passing game. I I would dare say Aaron Rodgers' favorite throw this year is to Brees Hall. It, it, it's not, uh, I'm looking downfield, I'm in trouble, I'm under pressure, let me dump this off to the running back. They are specifically running and a passing game behind getting Brees Hall the ball as a receiver. 
So he's got great receiving numbers. But then when Braylon Allen comes in, they kind of keep to that same mode. And he's such a great player. Uh, it worked last week. The lines haven't caught up. They're, I think they still see him as a backup running back. So the numbers are suppressed, kind of like with Austin Eckler. But the, the Austin Eckler, to me, was a gimme. Uh, the Braylon Allen should be a gimme in that he's getting more and more integrated into that offense, but they specifically use the running backs as pass game weapons. Denver's got a good defense, especially in the pass defense, so it's going to warrant even more throwing to the running backs. So Braylon Allen is my top play on that simple 10.5 yards over. So uh, is there a receptions prop, or is it not available because he's a backup? Uh, I will check. I think it was something ridiculous, like one and a half at minus 170. So they really hit it hard. I got you. Instead of making it two and a half, which is probably where it should be. Yeah. So I will check it as we're. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you like him for here. two or three receptions, I just noticed he had a lot of receptions, but not necessarily a big yards per reception, but doesn't mean he can't break one in this game. On DraftKings, he's uh, not listed right now. Uh, and the way that they're using it, he's arguably better than Brees Hall as a receiver out of the backfield. His snap count, his touch count just keeps rising week after week. So he's not going to get the Brees Hall treatment of six, seven, eight targets, but he should get two, three targets at a minimum. And what he does with the ball after the catch should get you it on potentially with just one catch. But I think the Denver Broncos aspect of this, because they're such an emerging good defense, especially in the secondary, it's going to warrant the Jets who want to throw to the running backs anyway to throw more to the running backs. And Denver just lost their key starting inside linebacker to help now, the now it's, it's still a yeah it's a good still a good linebacking group but that was their best linebacker right the middle linebacker that they lost yep okay so that's my first one okay. out the gate. And, I, and i like that i'm looking around i don't see it, that's going to be a draft kings but i don't see it on fanduel yet but yeah. i do like that i mean it makes it makes a lot of sense and i think the 10 and a half is It's a good number. I mean, where would you possibly have it? You know, you wouldn't have it much higher than that. I see it actually on uh, at, at uh, Caesars, William Hill, 10 and a half minus 119. So people are looking at the over for Real and Allen. They're uh, accepting that he's been in that role and I think and I playing. And I, at, I don't know what it's on DraftKings now, but I got it at minus 115. Okay. Yeah, and I, I do like that for the reason uh, reasons that you mentioned. Also, Garrett Wilson getting really good coverage. Uh, um, Denver's really good in the yeah, secondary. That's good defense. So everything should be uh, in the uh, against the front seven, and that's the Jets' offense has been geared to going heavy running back. Uh, the last two games, Braylon Allen playing more and more. Two catches on four targets week two, three catches on three targets week three. The yards per uh, catch are nothing spectacular, but his yards per carry as a runner are nice. He's just, he's a bigger play waning to happen. I think he sees um, more on the high side of targets three, four, five in this game that if anything happens to Brees Hall, it's going to be definitely game on so that's one that i like the uh two stair step receivers it's passing game um props for me this week last week i was trying to stair step it just seemed like last week there was a lot of opportunity with the running backs to do stair step this week i see a couple of uh receivers that are in a good zone the first one being Michael Wilson of Arizona at the bottom of the barrel pass defense of the Washington Commanders. Obviously, all the heat goes on Marvin Harrison Jr., so the props for a Wilson are 
favorable because they're going to think that Harrison Jr. is going to be the one that goes off and Trey McBride would probably be next in the pecking order. And Michael Wilson's season, week one, I think he just had one catch, but they all had like one catch in week one. It was weird what happened to the receivers for Arizona in week one. Week two, I think he got a couple more targets, but nothing spectacular. Week three, to me, and the key to this bet, one of the keys to this bet, a big part of it is the Washington pass defense. The other part of it is watching the game tape of Washington, uh, of um, Arizona versus Detroit last week. Michael Wilson was really, that was the best game I've seen him have as a pro because it was the best way that they've ever used him as a pro, not just a guy on the outside going deep. He was really a slot wide receiver in week three, had his best game of the season. I think he had seven or eight catches, but it, a, a lot of it was him kind of lined up in the slot, coming across the middle, taking short passes. He looked like Amon Ross St. Brown for Arizona, where Marvin Harrison is more going deep because he's a terrible route runner uh, NFL-wise. He's more... I'm going to go deep. I'm going to try to go in between coverage. I'm covered, but throw me the ball and I'm going to try to catch it. Detroit was deploying two, two uh, double coverage on him. So that just opened up more for Michael Wilson. I don't think the commanders can't handle receivers, single cover covered or double cover. I don't know if they'll double cover Harrison. Harrison's also nicked up. I think the 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 mood the vibe for Kyler Murray is starting to switch to Michael Wilson as his real pitch and catch BFF wide receiver. He's still trying to throw. They're going to lose. They're going to lose a lot of games trying to force it to Marvin Harrison. There's going to be plenty of forcing it to Marvin Harrison. But the the receiver that is actually running real routes and has a relationship with the quarterback now is Michael Wilson. Trey McBride has been in that role too, but McBride is also hurt. McBride may not play in this game. Harrison may not be 100%. uh, So the doors could be wide open to Michael Wilson against the worst pass defense in the NFL right now. Yeah, so my thoughts here are, you probably are a little bit, um, you might have found a better idea than I had. Because my my two props that I had for you and I was going to share uh, on my show, uh, which I, I texted uh, a few people this one already, Kyler Murray over one and a half touchdown passes. And I, I think it's only minus 130. And I was telling you and Andrew, I think the, the chances that he gets over two touchdowns in this game with a high total, uh, I think I, I would certainly put them at, in my mind, 65 70 percent of the time you play the game 10 times i think kyler murray's throwing two touchdowns seven times i think there's probably a game where uh arizona gets out such a lead he doesn't have to throw maybe he scrambles in for one but i I had michael wilson to score a touchdown at plus 270 and also michael wilson to score two touchdowns as the long shot bet 24 to 1 but laddering his receptions is interesting just based on the way the flow has gone for the cardinals where harrison has been scoring touchdowns so maybe in the case where I'm thinking all of them, I want Wilson touchdowns. I want the lot of the receptions and the yards because you're really hedging against one or the other game flows happening where if the t- touchdown targets are going to Harrison because they just have been lately and Wilson gets a lot of work against this uh, defense, you're getting, I mean, there's a chance you get them all, but who cares if you get one or the other, you know, if, if Harrison gets more catches and Wilson gets two touchdowns, you leave very happy. If Harrison gets the touchdowns and we're just basing it on a total, the highest total on uh, uh, on the board at 50, they're at home and we haven't seen Washington play a game yet where they've given up less than two passing touchdowns. Last week was three and I had uh, one more tale of woe and then we squashed that. I had the chase two touchdowns. I needed one more passing touchdown for Burrow for a big parlay. I did chase two, Burrow four. And they made the right call, handing it to the running back and having him run in from the one. But 
I needed that passing touch. Anyway, that was three. So I think targeting this Washington defense to give up passing touchdowns is a good idea or just passing in general. So 100% like that. I'm going to add Wilson ladder to the touchdown situation I had. And my best prop of the week is Kyler Murray over one and a half touchdowns. Who cares who he throws it to? Minus 130. Okay, so you said Harrison's nicked up. And we know that uh, um, there's a... um, it's a concussion for uh, McBride. McBride, right? So that is a situation where maybe he doesn't play, or if he does play, I mean, hopefully he's good. I like the guy, but it, certainly you're coming off a concussion. So does that mean they give him less usage? Does that mean he's more uh, prone to getting hurt and knocked out of this game? I think that yes, you have. I think you have value in an undervalued Michael Wilson. I 100% like that one. And I'm playing it up. To, I'm doing the 50 plus, the 60 plus, the 70 plus, the 80 plus, the 90 plus, 100 plus is plus 1200. So I'm stair stepping it all the way up. Yeah. And I would say that for the two touchdowns, which I think is interesting, well, for the one touchdown and two touchdowns, FanDuel had the highest odds on both of those as I scanned through. And there were a couple of sites that had two touchdowns at 12 to 1 or 14 to 1. So FanDuel currently at 24 to 1 was the place that I wanted to grab that. And for a single touchdown for Wilson. I saw it as low as plus 200, which I think two to one is uh, maybe fair. It's probably a little value, probably fair, but plus 270, obviously a lot better. You know, two two to one to score a touchdown. If you figure if, if Murray's going to throw three, I mean, I think you probably have about a third of a percent chance, you know, a third chance that it goes to Wilson. Let me offer you another name. If he's even at no, They've already caught up to it, so they must really think Trey McBride's going to be out. I was going to say the most likely guy to score or kind of underground score a touchdown for Arizona, catch a touchdown pass, would be Elijah Higgins, the receiving tight end who comes in as kind of a specialist. Um, But they already have him at plus 175. Wow. Anytime touchdown. That is, wow. That is, I'm shocked. Like, you can get Michael Wilson for plus 150 on that. So, uh, Higgins would be, to me, Higgins and Harrison are light, are, uh, strong for scoring a touchdown. Wilson's strong for just accumulating numbers. I mean, okay. what, what he did in week three. I was shocked, pleasantly surprised and shocked because I'm a big Michael Wilson fan. I think he's better than Marvin Harrison Jr. as a wide receiver, and you saw it on the week three tape, and they were using him like that. Kyler was using him like that. Kyler flings prayers to Marvin Harrison. He throws purposeful passes like what Detroit does with Amon Ross A. Brown. He was doing that with Michael Wilson. And I think important to the handicap, too, and maybe obvious, but worth stating, is you feel good about Washington pushing the pace. And even if they get a game like against the Giants where they move down the field and settle for field goals, they're still going to score enough to keep Washington moving. I think it's not as I don't don't think it's likely that Washington comes up with three or ten points in this game where at some point the Cardinals can just run. And I think they've. You know, you, you like the chances of a team that hasn't punted in two weeks against a defense that can be had to push the pace because we need both teams to get these props. Yeah, and Washington's offense has been stellar. Mm-hmm. Their defense has been the opposite. So yeah, I don't I don't know that a 20 point lead is safe on either side. Yeah. All right, did you have one more prop? I really like that one. I, I um that would be that's my number one. I'm laddering Michael Wilson for sure. Well, uh, my last one. What do you think the best play as an actual football play? What do you think the best play the Las Vegas Raiders have in the season of 2024? Punt? <laughs> that is their most likely outcome play. But Throwing when, it to Devontae Adams? You would think... That is not their best play. Okay. There's a play that is ringing the register for them, and I think they saw it even more in week three, and then they started really running with it. And that is 
a bubble screen or screen pass to the number three wide receiver, Trey Tucker. Okay. He had, I'm just going to look it up I, off the top of my head. I believe he had seven catches for about 80 yards on eight targets, but I'm going to look it up. He had seven catches for 96 yards and a touchdown on nine targets in that game. He's been, up until week three, he's been the, we're going to put him in. He, he always gets behind the defense. He's always good for a big play or a big play shot where he's open, but the quarterback doesn't hit him. But a lot of the time the quarterback hits him, but he'll only get the one play. He'll get, you know, a stat line for him typically is one catch for 30 yards. And you're thinking, why don't they get him the ball more? They also jet sweep him, or they did last year, and he'd always get 10 yards on it. But, of course, then they would never give it to him again. But this past week, uh, when they were getting rocked by Carolina and the offense was melting down and they have no offense on purpose, they just started throwing these tunnel screens to Trey Tucker, and that, that guy is... He's not Tyree Kill, but I mean, they kind of use him like an old school Tyree Kill. But it used to be that they'd only use him once or twice. Well, this past week they used him, tried it nine times, seven times successfully, and it was working. So obviously they kept going with it. It's such a simple play. I'm thinking they're going to go back to that well um, now that they saw what's possible. So you can stair step Trey Tucker. 25 or more yards is plus 100. 50 plus yards is plus 450. So I I just think they're getting the ball in Trey Tucker's hands way more than they have before after what they saw. I mean, he's been showing skills for since halfway into last season. He's been like instant offense. They just don't go with it. Well, last week they finally went with it. And I don't think they'll turn away from it. And he, even if they go back to their old ways, he could be um, one play and get the 25-yard uh, prop. But I think he's going to get a lot of plays. I think he's going to be a bigger part of the offense going forward because they need it. They don't I have, have anything say, else. It's very interesting the way he's being priced on FanDuel. Over 24 and a half yards is his is his number, and it's being juice to the under minus 120 but his over one and a half receptions is minus 168 so they're definitely going to have him for a few receptions but not a lot of yards and your point is he's very fast and so he did it by volume last week but last week they were playing well they were playing they had carolina last week uh playing at you know a, a really inspired game but so you were saying bubble screen so we're really thinking receptions more than yards is that the one that you're most more enthusiastic about I, they don't so, I, i'm i'm into the yards uh, on DraftKings. they got a 25 plus and they have a um 50 plus i can do the reception the receptions on DraftKings is a better scene um at two and a half receptions at plus 120 i like that a lot better and i think because the Raiders have such offensive problems, um, they can't get the running game going. They can't get to Devontae Adams because he's double covered so much. They can't sit back in the pocket and let things develop because their their line breaks down on them and plays crumble. But what they can do is sail a quick tunnel screen past to Trey Tucker and let him get off to the races, and it was working beautifully. And he has worked beautifully for many games. They just don't give into it. I'm thinking they're about ready to give into it. Well, so on paper, and probably in reality, you're facing a tougher defense this week, even though there's some injuries up front for Cleveland. But still, overall, I think you consider it a tougher defense. So that means, I think... Better coverage on Devontae, and it seems to me that would feed into doing that more. If you if you are facing a tougher defense and you've got this sort of simple play, low risk to to a speedy guy, 
So I, I really like the receptions. I, I don't mind the yards. I, I'd like to have the yards, but I think if I, if I if I could have one or the other, I would want the receptions. Their their run game. I'm just looking up to see if he has a rushing prop uh, out of curiosity. Their run game going forward maybe bubble screens and tunnel screens to Trey Tucker. So I think a lot of volume, and he's somebody, when he catches one of those tunnel screens, he's going for 5 to 15 yards a clip. And he can beat you deep. He's not just Wandale Robinson where you can do like the Giants did last night to Dallas. They could do that with Trey Tucker, uh, but Trey Tucker is also excellent deep. And if they start cheating up on him with those tunnel screens, he's going to go over the top for a big night. Well, even on FanDuel, I noticed longest reception over, or not longest reception, but to have a 20-plus yard reception, he's plus 130. So he's pretty you know, fairly priced for that long reception. So I think that uh, that suggests that his history was being someone who gets the ball deep. But his recent history now, the revelation is he's getting highly targeted in a tunnel screen game. So I, I, I could de- definitely... I'm going to shop around and see what kind of prices because I don't see alternate receptions yet for him. But I think once we get up into the six, seven range, we're going to get payouts that we like. So I'm good with uh, I'm good with that as well. So those so I like those. I like the I certainly like the idea of laddering, because, as I said, we were talking about tales of woe and crying and uh, uh, about our un- unfortunate situation. But the reality is of all the things I complained about, you get the you get one of those, which was Derrick Henry, and you're ahead of the game if you get them all. And and I did. Yeah. So I'm willing to keep firing. I really think that I love picking sides as far as playing in the contests, but I do believe the way to win money is uh, is things that are plus odds in terms of futures, uh, prop ladders. I think those are the ways to get the most uh, get the most bang for your buck and have a profitable season. So minus 110 is a really hard game to, 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 to beat. We try to beat it anyway, but this is the this is the answer, I think. So very good. Uh, I'll be playing those. And let's move on now to talk. You, you had a couple of teams that you were interested in looking at their futures odds. So let's do that. And also you had some ideas for defensive rookie of the year. So let's talk about the teams that you you're interested in their win totals after three weeks. Uh, I'm going to give you just two teams for uh, see what your reaction to it is. I think one of them is going to be very favorable. The other one, I'm not sure. Um, it's team we both love, the Los Angeles Rams. They're, all of their odds and win totals and all that have, have gotten better, and the win total numbers have gone lower because of the start that they have and all of the injuries. But that win over San Francisco was a not only a miracle, was not, was not only a great game played by them, but a uh, kind of a savior for the betting season for those of us that bet heavy on the Rams. That was one with all of their injuries I didn't think they were going to get. And you've got the Rams in a completely decimated state in week one and two, and three, should have beat Detroit and beat the 49. Those are two righteous teams to go beat when you got half your team missing. When they start, if and when they start to get back their team, I don't know that the Rams aren't the best team in football when we get to the second half of the season, if they can get everybody healthy. So with that, the win totals went from eight and a half down to seven and a half plus 100 on DraftKings, So I'm picking up that, but I also, as soon as they beat San Francisco, I'm like, I'm betting them to win the NFC West. Their um, NFC West number is uh, plus 800 because they, they started out. zero and two and, Seattle's at 3-0, and and San Francisco's obviously still in the division. Rams are in a state of disrepair on paper. So their odds are getting way out there. I, that's To me, that's still the best team in the NFC West. If they get some of their wide, they get their top cornerback back week five, they could get cut back week five or six. They'll get Puka back around week six, seven. 
if they can just hang in there, if they can stay within a game or two of everybody and then get healthy in the second half, to me, from what we've seen so far, and I'm interested to see what you think, I think the Rams are the best team in the NFC West on paper. Well, I did, after two weeks, take the Rams to win the NFC. I think it was 37, 32, 37 to 1. They were priced right around the... The Bears were a slightly longer shot, and the Bears won week one, and the Bears aren't winning the NFC. So I I did that. They managed to get the miracle uh, that they needed to win that San Francisco game. And I think a lot hinges on this week's game. The market is betting against the Rams pretty strong. You know, they're a full three-point favorite and even minus 115 at Circa. So I don't think they're moving off three. I think if anything, before kickoff, you might see three and a half. People really like the Bears this week. I I, I, tend, I respect w- what is being said on, on, the, on the Bears side, but I think that... Um, curious to know if you have any, you know, the, the injury stuff is really hard for me to get my arms around. You, you have a better idea of when people are coming back. You know, what state are they going to Chicago? This is a big game, obviously. I think you're going to be saying that about the Rams if you bet them every week. Because, <laughs> But the reason it's so big is week five, when you say some guys are coming back, that's Green Bay. So I, I do think there's a path here. I believe, I think Green Bay is going to beat Minnesota. And so I think then you might actually catch them in a good spot you might catch the Packers off of a big division win and potentially uh, have a shot at home against them. But it's, it's, it's definitely a tough road. And then I think about worst case scenario, they got to win. If they're one and four, obviously you're going to get some tremendous odds at that point in time. But even if they get healthy at that point and start playing, I think we both believe this is a team that could win you know, 80% of their games the rest of the way. And I look at them the same way as the incredibly frustrating Bengals that I'm down on. I mean, the Bengals lost on Monday Night Football. They knocked me out of Survivor, but they were missing half their defense. I mean, shame on me for for picking them anyway. It was kind of a like 900 and something others in Circus Survivor. I thought they're not going 0-3, and, and they did it. But even, even I look at the Rams and Bengals. Going into the season, they were my picks. I was hoping one or the other would be a one or a two and get some home games. But either one of those guys, oh, teams get into the playoffs Play they, and they're going to have to be playing well in order to get to the playoffs with how bad they're starting. But you have momentum, you have experience, quarterbacks and coaches that have been to the Super Bowl on one side have won the Super Bowl. So I, I still feel optimistic, and I feel just very discouraged with how injured they're getting. It, it, you know, if they lose the Chicago game, you're going to get some even better odds. But to, to your division point, Seattle three and zero, one of the easiest schedules going. I don't mind Seattle. I just think that they're a team that's going to win nine games. I, I don't think they're a team that's going to run and hide in the division. Rams are as of today ahead of the 49ers with the tiebreaker. That's the and, biggest thing for and me. They're, and, and they're behind Arizona, and I'm not. I'm okay with them being right behind Arizona. That's that's fine. If if San Francisco was two and one right now, I'd be a little less cocky about the Rams but the fact that San Francisco's giving us them at one and two helping the because I don't believe for a second Seattle's winning this division watching their games they are not winning this division unless Stafford and Purdy go down now for the rest of the season and then I don't even know if that would help get Seattle to win this division Seattle is a total fraud so San Francisco being at one and two and mostly, and in a better overall state of health than the Rams have been. But then the Rams beating them and getting one and two, so now they have that edge over the 49ers um, already in to win the division uh, in a tiebreaker. They've already got one step of the way there. Obviously, they're going to play them again. That the San Francisco being down is part of this, but I think the Rams, if they can get back to anything close to to full strength, they're going to be the team to beat in that division. And watching Chicago, Chicago is so bad. So uh, one of the to me one of the worst teams in the NFL. Caleb Williams is putting the ball at risk. Almost every other time he's throwing, he's putting the ball at risk. Everybody's excited that, oh, Caleb Williams threw for 300 yards and he threw for his first 
touchdown passes and all that. That was a game that he was uh, – the Colts should have been up by 20 points at halftime. They, they were the, – the, Caleb Williams was giving them that game. Right before halftime, he threw a Hail Mary, and it actually landed to DJ Moore, and he got tackled at the one-yard line. Like, that game almost flipped to the Bears on a Hail Mary in the first half. But fortunately, DJ Moore got tackled at the one. But that gave Caleb Williams 45 free yards for his 300-yard day. He was still struggling into the third quarter, started throwing picks, started throwing near picks. But in the fourth quarter, the Colts were trying to sit on the lead, and they couldn't. Anthony Richardson kept matching Caleb Williams for turnovers. And then the Bears just threw against a prevent defense. Basically, the way that the Colts played the Bears was we're going to we're going to stop the run we're going to contain Caleb Williams if he wants to run I dare you to throw deep and so he had time in the pocket and he was making yards but it did not look good there was so many near miss picks and near miss pick sixes and that's with a terrible Colts team I'm going to assume a a better coached Rams team is going to just turn the bears upside down by just being a better a better run schematically offense and defense so but i'm with you they got to get that chicago win if they get that chicago win which they should and i think you can bet it with the points i think you can bet it with the money line they get that win a lot of health starts to open up the following week when, well, De- when uh, Demarius Williams theoretically is going to come off of injured reserve, their best corner. Well, I, I look at it like that. The, the when I listen to podcasts all week, I know this to be true, but it's not documented. Whenever I really disagree with something someone says, that's really what I'm listening for. I'm not listening for ideas. I have ideas. I, I know on Monday when I put my numbers into the computer who I like for the following week, I, I'm not looking for, I'm looking for things I disagree with because those, that's a great winning percentage. And uh, Phil Sims has, a, uh, Chris Sims rather has a podcast. And I don't know if it was Chris Sims or the other guy. I wasn't sure who's who. Their voices sounded decently similar, but they were talking about this game and they said, well, the Rams are going outdoors into the elements. And I said this on the podcast this week. I don't know if that's that hurricane is getting going to be in Chicago and the weather's going to be bad. But when I think about the elements in Chicago, I think about cold and wind and rain. That's not happening. There are no yeah. elements. It's a dome team going outside. I remember when the Rams went to Buffalo, they were toe to toe with the bills the Rams. Can't, it's not, they can't play outside. They just, they just happen to play in a dome. They're, they're, I think they'll be fine from that and, perspective. And remember yeah. them against the Ravens last year, one of their turning points games at Baltimore later Listen, in the season in the yeah. rain. That was one of the best games that anyone played against the Ravens all yeah. year. And so the Rams, so so he, they said outside in the elements, I was like, nonsense. And then he said something I think is even more nonsense. He said the Bears will finally be able to run the ball against this smaller Rams front. Now, Mike Lombardi that last week said the Bears offensive line can't get a push against Notre Dame's defensive line. So that's another thing I think is nonsense. So what I'm concerned about is this. Uh, can, so, can I jump something in there real yeah, quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Indianapolis Colts run defense was the single worst thing that it, was, it was on NFL tape for two weeks. You, and they four, completely shut down the Bears' run game. Exactly. And so that was the part of the handicap of last week's game was is is the the Colts are the worst run defense, so maybe the Bears can get a go against them. It's a real statement that they couldn't. My, my concern is this. It, it, my only concern, really, because I like to watch the market. I don't like to – make it uh, twist me up into knots. But by the time I get to Saturday, it has. The Rams are taking 60% of the of the, of the cash, at least uh, based on the pregame.com site that I see. So I, I like to see that the team that's getting bet, uh, the market's responding to that. If, if the books are, if the line is going up and the books are saying, give me more Rams money, that's where I want to stop and be concerned. You know, it's like, uh, it's like, uh, Chris Jones of the Chiefs, you know, rushing the quarterback and no one's blocking him. And he starts looking around like, where's the screen pass coming? And, he, and he, he's so good. He did that the other night. So that's my only concern here that I'm keeping an eye on, because when I said Circa was at the high, now I just looked and everyone's at a flat three minus 110 on this game. So it's not going up. I don't think it's going above three, but I want to see if the if the money's on the Rams, 
I, I don't think it's going to move off three. I think it's kind of comfortable on three. I'm okay with that. But it did go from two and a half to three while the money was on the Rams. So the other side of that is if the Bears are the sharp play this week, I'm okay to, disagreeing with that because I think I have an angle here, which is, you know, everyone wants to beat up on the beat up Rams. I, I get the uh, momentum. You just beat San Francisco. Kind of that is a, a huge win. How do you put the genie back in the bottle? But they're also one and two. I mean, it's not like they can say, let's kick back because we beat the uh, the 49ers. Rather, they beat the 49ers. You, you got to get your season back now. And it's good that they are an underdog because that sends them the message that people still don't believe in them and that they're expected to lose this game. So they can't take it lightly. But it reminds me of early season last year, Bryce Young and Carolina, when before the season, everybody was so sure in Vegas that Bryce Young was the thing and that Carolina was the sleeper to win the division and it fell apart. The fantasy football side, I can tell somewhat the mood on things via fantasy football. And there was a big disparity last year between the analysts continued to back and love Bryce Young and said it was coming any any week now. It's, it's getting ready to happen. It's, it's coming. It's coming. So they kept ranking him highly for fan, ranking him higher than they should have for fantasy, and they were still believing in him. But the uh savvy fantasy players had already bailed on Bryce Young they were even kind of uh a- after week 1 and before the season started they were seeing through this Bryce Young thing and starting to go towards CJ Stroud i think analysts still think they're smart still basing everything on Caleb Williams is going to be a star because he's supposed to be so Vegas loves him Joe football fan still loves them because the analysts love them. But I see in fantasy, people are bailing on, we're bailing on Caleb Williams the after week one and after week two, they're coming back to him because he had some nice numbers, but he had basically two games worth of numbers in one game because of the passing attempts. I just think smart people see that there's all kinds of problems with the bears the analysts still love the Caleb Williams story that they loved in April, March, June, July. Kind of like what Bryce Young, it took them a while before they finally, I mean, it took a half a season last year before they stopped with the Bryce Young stuff. When when Carolina was winless and then they beat uh, Houston, then it was, oh, Bryce Young has arrived. We told you it's finally here. Bryce Young has arrived. He beat C.J. Stroud and... Now look at where we're at. Now look at how the season ended for them. So I think they're still in the honeymoon phase with Caleb Williams. It hasn't hit them yet that he's not the one. So that is, I guess, part of what you'd be betting against is people look and say, Rams just had a big win. We don't want to back him. Caleb just threw for 325. And I did hear that a couple of times, RC, this week. The that Finally... This this line and Caleb is starting to click. Uh, so I will say this as far as a final concern that I think is worth addressing. Chicago's defense looks really good to me. They they really played well against Houston on that Sunday night game, really well. In fact, I felt like they were what what I was living in fear of as as a Houston survivor backer is Houston wasn't running the ball, and I thought the Bears and they want, they're going to intercept one of these passes for a touchdown. And they almost did the one that hit the ground, and he ran it in for a touchdown. So they they can play. Uh, for sure. And so with you're going on the road here with it, you need a, a running game and a defense. I feel like when I'm backing a road team, do we have a running game? And I think we like the Rams defense, even with injuries or we don't. I mean, what, what's the kind of the final well, thought on the Rams running game and, and defense versus Chicago defense? Let's take it back to last week. So the Bears play the Colts. The Colts ravaged by injuries on defense, much less talent on defense, statistically one of the worst defenses, especially against the run. They go play Chicago with Anthony Richardson throwing 
passes all over the place, including to the Bears. It was the it it was the most perfect setup for Chicago to win a game was the Colts terrible defense and their sputtering offense. And yet they had still lost to the Colts. The Colts should have won that game by 20 plus points. And the Colts didn't even really play that well. It's just the bears are that bad. They can't move the ball on the ground. Caleb Williams is constantly putting the ball in distressful situations so I, I think if they can't, if they can't handle the Colts, they're not going to be able to handle the Rams. Yes, Jonathan Taylor's got a better run game than uh, what the Colts do, but Matthew Stafford is also a better passer than Anthony Richardson to help open up the run game. And Richardson and as, was matching turnover for turnover. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. No, Tur- turnover for yeah. turnover with Caleb Williams. It was the most... If the Bears were going to win, the Bears got more gifts against Tennessee and barely pulled that one out. They definitely got outplayed. They were just given the gifts and won. They were almost given the same exact gifts against Indianapolis and lost. If a team just goes in and plays a solid game against them, they're going to get whacked. I mean, you you need a team to be to match them like the Titans and the Colts. You need a team to match them turnover for turnover. And then hopefully Chicago pulls it out in the end. I just don't think that's the Rams are going to be turnover for turnover. Well, and defenses are starting to see how to play Caleb. The Colts played a smart game against Caleb. They're like, go ahead, go ahead and take your 10 and 15 yard shots. Go ahead and, try to throw the ball downfield. You're you're going to complete one. You might complete a second. You might even complete a third. We're going to pick you off on one of these um, on yeah. a, out of every five passes, we're going to get one on you and they damn well almost did. And I trust, I do trust McVay to go in there with that game plan of he loves to run the ball anyway, whether or not they can run. But you, you know that, that you're you're a vulnerable favorite if you can't run the ball. And I, I think the Bears are struggling to run. Then you're leaving it to Caleb. And I think that the Rams will play it smart and potentially win a low scoring, uh, maybe one of those low scoring games where they put some distance between them, uh, maybe like a, you know, a 17 to 7 or something like that or 20 to and you've got- 10 in a situation. You've got two, four, 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 five running um, outside linebacker edges and verse and young. So the where Caleb can beat you is if he escapes your sack attempt and he starts running around in circles and extends the pocket for seven seconds. He's really good when he's on the run in a panic. He finds things and he's got a laser beam arm. He's great when he's on, but. When you can get to him, when he starts doing that, he gets nervous and uh, high-level athletes, not Pac-12 bottom feeders, uh, defensive lines. Uh, He can't get past the NFL linemen like he did in college, and the Rams have two of the best outside corners that that are faster than he is. So he's not used to that. He's used to being able to outrun and run around in circles on those guys. The Rams have a lot of speed on the front line. Okay, well, I, I like that, and uh, I'm glad we had that conversation because it, it was a game where, in my mind, I was going back and forth. And uh, so to close the the loop there and move on to the next team, yes, I am still uh, – I'm, I'm, ba- I'm not running away. I'm backing uh, – I backed my Rams bets before the San Francisco game. I didn't do anything this week, but I have plenty on the Rams' futures. I definitely took that 30-plus to 1 to win the NFC. I jumped on them for the division. I still believe in the Rams, and I, and I do like the setup. Uh, honestly, even the worst-case scenario, at some point, they're 1-4. and four. Now, you're going to get a real, uh, real high odds at that point, but I, I don't think they're done even then. Were they 1-4 and four last year, too? Uh, I don't remember if they were. No, they won 10 games. I don't think they got... But I think it all came late. Go you think they were that low? Thought. I'll check it. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm busy right now. Uh, also, uh, RCI have 15 bets all on Michael Wilson uh, <laughs> that I'm trying to put in. So it's taking a little bit of time. I, and that I'm is tr- part of the show when we're talking. All of a sudden, like, what did I bet? 
while we were talking real quick. Well, you know, I already had the idea of Michael Wilson with the touchdowns, but the latter situation makes sense. So when you see the, um, uh, the, the camera on the television focused on the blue tent, you don't even need the volume on, you know, Michael Wilson's in there. (laughs) Uh, the Rams were two and three. Okay. Uh, and then three and six. Oh, okay. Going into the, uh, so they, so they, so they've been here before. And the thing is, it's not, it's a different situation than Cincinnati. Cincinnati is starting to concern me because of, you know, the Higgins chase holdouts. I don't, I don't blame them for the holdouts, but it's still a thing. Burrow's a great leader, but I, I honestly, I was thinking about this uh, the other day, walking the dog and I'm like, why am I back in the, I mean, I like Burrow. Uh, I mean, I like Burrow a lot, but with the, the frosted hair, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't like it. You the know, frosted I mean, hair factor. I, I thought about it and I was like, he has frosted hair. So obviously there's something, uh, you know, like Mike McDaniel, uh, uh, Lombardi was making fun of him for looking like a little DJ, you know, and it's like your focus, can't be, your focus can't be on. I think you've lost the eye of the tiger that when, when there's foil in your hair and you're getting frosted tips, I, I think. Well, but you know why he did that? I don't. You know what he was doing when he showed up, before he showed up to training camp with his new blonde hair, you don't know what he was doing before that? Oh, getting a pedicure? Worse. <laughs> he was in a fashion show in Paris. You say worse? I actually got not, a pedicure this week. Not to, um, oh, I'm all about the pedicure. Um, I, got, I got the gift card when I ran the marathon. I'm like, hey, I've never used this. It was great. So he was in a fashion yeah, show. I oh. see you getting frosted tips. Then I'm not going to take any of your bets. You should do that. Everyone <laughs> should. If you see me getting frosted tips, say, stop. You know, there's something else going. You, you lost the eye of the tiger is my concern there. So I, I'm still hopeful with the Bengals because there is an excuse for them. They start slow and then they had half their defense missing against Washington. So there's an excuse. They can turn it but around. They had to win that game. And no Trent Brown, they're in trouble. And there's a yes, yes, they are in trouble. I think Cincinnati's in more trouble than uh, than the Rams. So the Rams, I believe, not just because they they eked out the win, which they, they you know they should have lost to San Francisco, but just give them a couple of wins, whatever. Get get this game. It's huge. Two and two with all the stuff they've been through. And you're right. When this team gets back to full strength, even if they have a bad record, I still believe because their schedule actually gets easier the second half of the year than it is. And, you know, because they've they played some I mean, they played San Francisco and Detroit so far. They played some good games. So uh, they can get seven and a half wins with the team that they've got now. Yeah. The, the win total was one we didn't talk about. But, yes, 100 percent for that as well. So then my other one real quick. Yeah. Um, just to get a quick reaction on, I stair-stepped my new favorite team in the NFL, the team that I think is the best-looking team, best-looking roster, best-looking everything, Packers to win the NFC North because the odds are going against them because as Minnesota rises and as Jordan Love has been out, Packers to win the NFC North, Packers to win the NFC uh, in, in total at plus 900, and Packers to win over nine and a half games at plus 110, and Packers to win the Super Bowl at plus 1,800. Yeah, I got to say, what's I, I get it because the defense... The defense is really, this is a good team. And you know what, LaFleur. This is a really good team. They're a good team. And I was, I was listening, uh, and I, I don't have it. I actually have it if I want to look Minnesota here. Minnesota is a look. good team. Green Bay is a really good team. Yeah, and I think um, if there's one team that is going to show a head fake and then get back to reality, I think it's potentially Minnesota. And obviously I love the Vikings, so I feel maybe that's, maybe it's just the, the Viking fan in me. But I also feel like, it, you know, it's it's a it's a good team, opportunistic, but you know, I feel like once they get punched in the mouth, it, it, reality will set in. This is a team that had a win total of seven and a half. The Vikings. So let's not go crazy over the three and zero. Oh. Super impressive the the games that they won. Kind of felt like they were getting Houston at a good time. Uh, San Francisco, s- same situation. Uh, they were coming off a big, you know, week one 
game against the Jets. I felt like Monday Night Football kind of kicking off the season. And at Minnesota is a tough place. So they, they got both of those teams at home. Minnesota is maybe the biggest team with splits when you put them outside on grass. Like, unlike the Rams, who I don't care if they're outside. I do care if the Vikings are outside. So, I, I, I you know, I love the Vikings, but I picked, I picked Green Bay this week. I really feel like strongly about Green Bay at home. And uh, I, I think that you're right. What gives me... Uh, not even pause, but just in the back of my mind and probably on everybody's mind is you have one game with love and, and two games with Willis. And, you know, I, I believe in love, but even coming into the season, it was sort of a still, Hey, prove that the last eight games last year weren't, uh, weren't a fluke or weren't a sh- just short sample size where anything could happen. And, and he hasn't had the opportunity to do that given that he got hurt in that first game. Now I love the offense with, with Jordan love in there because you know, three, four great receivers deep. It's a very interesting team. They can run the ball and three um, running backs deep. Yeah, I mean, it's really a it's really a, a talented roster. So I I think that looking at the landscape in the NFC right now, I I can't fault anyone. And I think I do have a little bit of Green Bay, but I probably should have a little more just because of how well, because uh, of the odds. I, I took them and the Rams because the odds are getting uh, out there. Because of the injury, because of love being out, and yeah. because and in Minnesota, all of a sudden entering the fray. So I mean, Minnesota's uh, going to be hard to put down. The Lions may be the best team in the NFC, but they also have pretty good odds. San Francisco's not going to disappear, but they have the best odds. So I'm I'm not necessarily saying oh lock it in the Packers are going all the way I'm saying the odds on the Packers and the odds on the Rams compared to how um, trying to evaluate them against Detroit and San Francisco it's a lot closer than what the odds are saying and I think in the NFC it's those four te- you no one else is winning the NFC besides San Francisco the Rams or Green Bay or Detroit but and the odds on the Rams and Green Bay is getting out there. Yeah, and I, so my last thing with, with Green Bay, where it's kind of like I'm, uh, if they win this week, as I expect, then I, I get a little more confirmation. And I don't know why I can't find uh, the note, but I did hear this week that LaFleur has a really good record, like 15-3 and three in his career in weeks one, uh, one through three of the season. And then he's like 40-35 and 35 the rest of the way. So I, I was just kind of interested to keep an eye out for that, where typically the Packers have been lights out the first three weeks of the season, which I need to put in the archives because I didn't realize that. I want to know that in August of next year and read that note again. And then they kind of still win, but level off as far as the... So let's see if that's the pattern that continues. Them pulling off two wins against... Um, or two pulling off two wins with Malik Willis at quarterback is a stunning development. It, it really is. Now that they've done it, you think, okay, they did it. But before those two games happened, you would have said, I I'll bet give, against I'm them not going to give you. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so for, for the point that you're making, it's really good is the odds on green Bay. You want to grab them because they're three and oh, if they beat the Vikings, you know, they're, they're, they're on their way to potentially the one seed. So you you, you you feel very confident they're going to be in the mix, but you can't discount the fact that this team could have the, could have home field. And you're going to have good, whether you think they're going to win the NFC or not, you have a good price on a team that could potentially have home field. And, and, and you feel very confident they're going to be in the mix. you got to grab it. you got to have that uh, in your account. And Detroit looks beatable. Uh, that's the other part of this. Because to me, this is San Francisco, Detroit, Green Bay, and the Rams. And But for the odds, if you're going to give me any of those two teams, I'll take Green Bay and the Rams, whether they win their divisions or not, to be, by the end of the season, be better than Detroit and San Francisco. Or so close to it that the odds... I'd rather ride with the higher odds, the juicier odds on Green Bay and the Rams. But I have some Detroit, too, as a hedge. But the San Francisco odds have been so bad, I don't want anything to, I don't need to to hedge with them. I'm basically betting against San Francisco that it will be Detroit, Green Bay, or the Rams. But the Rams and, and Green Bay's odds are getting out there where I just added to it. 
yeah, I think that um, it's the fun of playing futures, right? I mean, you, you can you can wait and hedge on the actual game if you're in a high leverage situation like a playoff game, or you can add a little now at high prices and you're 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 you're, you're you're betting against yourself a bit, but you're hedging. You're, you're just, you're hedging. So if you wind up in a NFC championship game with the Rams and Packers, you're sitting back knowing that you're going to make this much money. If the Rams win, you'll make this much money. If yeah. the Packers win, you do, you're just, you're not even, you know, versus if someone going to the point spread and taking it 110 or taking the risk of a money line on the underdog, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, I think the Packers, you know, if they get into the playoffs, the, the same way I feel about the Rams, I feel about the Packers. They're not getting a touchdown against any of these other teams. So when you're talking about hedging situation, you got a cheap money line to do so. So, um, so yeah, that I, I, I support. So I don't, I don't mind in the futures market. If you're picking off, if you're betting it all at one time and you're picking multiple teams or multiple players for an award, you know, it's a little, little um, less, uh, well, a lot less uh, preferable to picking off the teams at, at certain times where you're getting the most value. Uh, so if you're shopping for these lines and getting really good lines, you can have three teams to bet the, to win the NFC at favorable odds with that bucket of, because you're, because you didn't bet them all at once. You took them all at their, at their uh, lowest point or, you know, a yeah, better I'm going to, I'm going to come out ahead with the way that I've bet it, if Detroit, Green Bay, or the Rams win, I'm just adding more to my Rams and Packers uh, bucket uh, because the odds are going against them getting juicier to do so. So if San Francisco ends up winning it again, I'm screwed. But I don't think there's anybody else you can talk about in the NFC that's going to get to the Super Bowl that's not San Francisco, the Rams, Green Bay, or Detroit. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, unless you said Minnesota. So, yeah, that's. And Even if, if Minnesota wins the division, I don't think they can get to the Super Bowl over those teams when those, when the Lions, and the, if the Rams get healthy and all that, when all those teams get humming, when they've played 10 and 11 and 12 game, when they start coming on. I don't think Sam Darnold can get you to the Super Bowl, no matter how good the rest of the team is. I agree. You're probably right. And I think that, um, again, but even if you're going to take positions on these teams at different points of time at the best value, if you have Minnesota in there, I don't mind leaving Minnesota out at all. I have no problem with leaving them out. If Minnesota loses this week, their odds probably really – crumble uh so i might pick up some minnesota just as insurance chip just like when i bet the um rookie passing leaders i was betting against caleb williams so i got bo Nix and Jaden daniels but i took some michael Penix and some drake may at the high odds just to have a hedge in case something crazy happens so um minnesota i could see um with when the, if they lose if they win obviously their odds are going to get really strong but if they lose this week those odds are going to come in some because all of a sudden Detroit will probably be tied with them and Green Bay well they'll all be tied yeah um, and they'll be so, somewhat forgiven for a road loss against the Packers so I don't think they're going to get they won't get but, killed but the shine but the of undefeated to comes change. off yeah the the odds have to change when they go from three and zero alone at the top. And if they were to win 4-0, then it'd be really good. Um, yeah. But if they lose and everybody's 3-1, and one, you know they're the ones that are going to be priced out as not going to be able to get past Green Bay and Detroit at that point. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. So we talked about a little – I mean, we talked a lot about the week, this week's games. Do you have a, um, a best bet you want to throw out before we wrap up? Or um, I think the um, – the two now it's escaped me. Who the heck's Detroit playing? Um, Their Monday night, the second Monday night game hosting Seattle. Oh yeah, that's. I think Seattle is so set for a fall, and Detroit is such a a good team that knows how to win, finds a way to win when there's a problem. That they're going to go in 
to or they're going to be hosting a Seattle team that's a little full of itself and I think Seattle's going to just get punched squarely in the mouth and there's a potential that that Detroit game is going to be a blowout win that the odds reflect oh Seattle's 3 and 0 oh, they're on the come they're not. I I watched the Seattle games and I don't yeah, I'm not impressed at all not I'm not saying they're terrible or anything but they're not in Detroit's class at all they had that game where they went to they went to Detroit last year, year week two, and uh, and beat them. So Detroit's got a little revenge, or you could say Seattle's got a little experience going to going to Detroit and having success. I I by, uh, at a high level, I'll say usually I love to look for points and underdogs, but underdogs have done so well. It's kind of a, a little bit of more uh, fuel on my pick of Dallas last night, which lost. Is the favorites have to, they don't have to come through right now it's not like right now is the time that it has to regress and get even but there's certainly so I, I guess for that I would say Detroit minus three and a half I, I I would be less afraid of laying points now than in a normal time because of how many underdogs won so I'm looking for favorites that and Detroit was they opened four and a half and they were bet down to three and a half so you're right there is definitely love for Seattle I think um I think Ragnow is huge on the injury. Like every game, the injury reports are are, are dizzying at, to this point. But Ragnow would be a big get, right? Get back for for Detroit. Um, and see, Seattle at home versus a rookie quarterback debut, which should have been the give me of all gimmies. And if the, Seattle was really this good, they should have blown Denver to kingdom come in week one. And Denver damn near won that game. At the had chances to win at the end when they really had no business doing so because Seattle just is not good enough to put teams away. Then the following week against a very weak New England Patriots team, they had to go to overtime yeah. to end up beating the Patriots. And then uh, last week, who did they have a near miss again with that they should have beat up? Um, Carolina, uh, no, not Carolina. I'm in 2023, uh, 2024. Miami, Miami. Oh, right, 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 yeah, yeah. It was 17 to three in the fourth quarter. Tim Boyle had just driven Miami down um, to goal to go, I think, or in deep in the red zone. Took two shots at passes in the end zone that. Uh, were tough catches, but one was dropped, one couldn't be caught, and then the other one was uh, thrown too high. They were inches away from making that game with Tim Boyle at Seattle. Yeah, at Seattle, with all of the advantages, that game was almost 17 to 10 with about seven minutes left. With Miami, I'll play, I just watched that game back um, yesterday. Miami was right there with them. Toad. I mean, they had the uh, Tim Boyle disadvantage, but I thought that Miami outplayed or played toe to toe with Seattle, and they had no. And Miami's not good, um, so they've played a incredibly weak schedule, a cr- incredibly fortuitous schedule, and they've barely escaped. I mean, they won twenty four to three last week. It was not that type of game. Uh, it was much closer, um, especially considering that um, Tim Boyle almost led them to getting that down to a one-score game in Miami with the momentum. So I'm totally unimpressed with Seattle, and I'm sure they think that they are great, and I think they're going to walk into a buzzsaw against Detroit. The only uh, other thing I had in my uh, notes, and I think that might be a little overdone when you look at Mike McDonald and what Baltimore did last year, but in matter of fact, when they, if you remember, Detroit went into Baltimore last year, maybe maybe played their worst game. Maybe their worst game was Thanksgiving against Green Bay, knocking people out of Survivor. But they definitely got stepped on, and that was, so that was a Mike McDonald defense that only gave up six points to Goff. When then the Detroit went in there five and one. But I also remember situationally, it wasn't a great spot for the Lions. They went at Baltimore and and got beat up. Now I know that the talent on Seattle is not the same, but it was just one thing in my notes that I thought I'd mention and get your reaction to before we, before we go. Well, I, I watched the, um, watching the Miami game tape and I'm watching Skylar Thompson against what's supposed to be this vaunted defense and this vaunted secondary. And I thought it was a vaunted secondary. Um, 
and I'm watching Skylar Thompson just snap off passes seven yards, 13 yards downfield over the middle. Guys are wide open. I'm like, where is the cut? If see if Seattle was that defense, if this if the, there was this Mike McDonald uh, magic fairy dust that was going to uh, you know just make opposing offenses cry, and make Bo Nix cry, and make Skylar Thompson cry, and make Tom Tim Boyle wasn't that flustered against this defense. If Seattle was that defense, they should have just consumed Miami. Um, last week, and they really didn't. So I, yeah. I they're going to play. They're going to play by far the best team that they've played this season, and I don't think they're. I think they're going to get a comeuppance. Well, and I, I, I think that that's uh, legit, and I think that the idea that Mike McDonald is a respected coach, I accept that. But also, I know that if you think about next year's team or two years from now, Seattle defense. That's going to be more Mike McDonald's defense that he built. Right now is the Seattle players with a with a, with a a good coach, or at least a, he had a great run with Baltimore, but different, different talent, different situation as a coordinator. So I like him as a coach, but I just, what I reject is the idea that he moves to Seattle and we give him 100% of the defense that he had in Baltimore in Seattle, which just, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's what everyone seems to be when they talk about Seattle. That's the way they talk about it. But I think about just whatever you give them credit for two years from now, you have to you have to rewind that and take the credit away for today. I'm, I'm sure people are looking at their their statistical models and going, wow, look at this Seattle uh, defense. They are holding teams down and scoring. They're holding teams down in yards. This is so awesome. But again, they got the Bo Nix debut, Jacoby Brissett, and Skylar Thompson, Tim Boyle. Sure. And no turnovers against New England or Miami. Well, that's it. You look at the, the, the easy schedule, that happens, right? But at least you should you should crush your easy schedule. Yeah, playing, I wanted this, that's what I wanted to see on tape was something that's like, oh my goodness, who's, who, who could ever think to move the ball on Seattle? when you got a Skylar Thompson or a Jacoby Brissett, it's not, that's not happening on tape. Teams are moving the ball fine. Okay. Bad teams are moving the ball fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, for, um, I'll just give mine just to, just to get us out of, out of here. It's the, it was, it was close between two teams. I've got two really that I really like this week, but I think that, um, well, the Packers over the Vikings, or the, 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 the that's my best bet. I think, and I'm uh, assuming it's going to be Jordan Love. Highly assuming it's going to be Jordan Love. Yeah, and the thing is, if they have Willis, obviously that's no good as far as a contest pick because you're, you know, you're, you're minus two and a half. Your your line in the market is going to change significantly. So Vikings plus two and a half would be just too much value based on the the quarterback. Okay, so if you want to say quarterback uncertainty there and jump, I'll give an extra one. And that would be the Ravens. And I know that a lot of people are on the Bills this week, but it's just, you know, I've my regression numbers, they come so strong against the Bills. I, uh, I'm looking here and, and what I'm the the one thing that I'm working into my handicapping is looking. And really, for me, it starts as a process of elimination. So I've got a sheet here with lines through teams and I've only got about a 12 or 13 left. And then I'm putting the bet splits and the, the team that I have that is uh, uh, acceptable for consideration that has the least amount of money on them is the Ravens. The Bills are getting 84% of the cash, so the Ravens are 16%. As I look at last year's sheet, RC, that I, that I have here, um, you know, most of the teams that were getting uh, you know, 20-ish percent of the cash, uh, it was the Eagles, it was the Lions. It was, the only thing that bucked it was the Jaguars, and uh, you know they, they weren't eliminated for any reason, and they weren't getting bet, and they, they no-showed. So you're going to have stuff like that, but I, I'm looking at the teams that had under 50%, and they did very well. So it's something I'm, I'm really just in the uh, early phases of, but I think just intuitively we know the teams that uh, are less bet on are going to be better bets than the teams that are heavily bet because most people lose. You know, most of the people that after a Sunday, the books have more of the money than the public or the, the players, I should say. Which is why betters got whacked uh, last week when all the 2-0 and o teams started falling to all the 0-2 teams. 
And I think that gets extended even hotter this week, even if you just step back and didn't analyze the game, didn't do anything. You just like, I'm going to go against all the three and O teams and I'm going to go with all the, you know, I'm going to go with the Bengals and I'm going against Buffalo and Seattle. I think you can do that without even knowing anything about these teams. The one, the, the last one, the one that I wanted to get your quick opinion on that I don't think it's going to happen with is I think the Chiefs are also a nice bet against the Chargers because the Chargers don't have anybody uh, or it, they've lost the best parts of their offensive line. No Bosa, no Derwin James. And I was just watching the Herbert game uh, against Pittsburgh this morning and I, if he doesn't play, it's going to be worse, and, and I don't think he's going to play. But if he does play, he's sailing the ball all over the place because he can't play in his foot. Um, so if he plays, it's a problem. If he doesn't play, it's a problem. They're missing their best offensive linemen, and they're missing their best uh, defensive players. I think they just everything is going wrong for the Chargers to face a healthy, relatively healthy, good, obviously, Chiefs team that gets every advantage in the book, including a timely Derwin James suspension. Yeah, that's 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 the one that uh, that's a big one. And then it's both offensive. It's potentially uh, Slater and all two two tackles out. That could be a real problem, obviously, against the Chiefs defensive yeah, line. And I really don't think Herbert's playing this week, so I'm yeah, and the I'm line went down to, in on KC. Yeah, the line went down to seven, so I think probably he's not playing. And like you said, if he is, he's compromised enough where it's worth it. Uh, I have both of those teams crossed out, so I've got reasons to not play either one. And honestly, I was happy about that because what – what I feel like my weakest uh, handicapping uh, element of my game is injury analysis. I, I, I'm lost when it comes to injuries. I, I see that uh, someone's going to play and then they're out. And it's, um, you know, I, so many fantasy football lineups of mine go with injured players because breaking news at 1215 or 1230, someone's inactive. I'm usually not catching that. I'm so exhausted from handicapping. I just want to relax and enjoy the last half hour before the game start. But that's not the right uh, attitude to have. It's really an important you were, time. You were not rattled by the Bengals losing both of their defensive tackles going into last week. Well, um, I, you know, I guess I knew that they had those injuries, but by the time they're ruled out, the survivor picks are in. But you're right. I mean, it, well, I, I will say that the, the regret that I have on the Bengals is not losing both tackles because I have a note from last year. I was reading my last year notes just to say, what did I say after the game that don't make this mistake twice? And it was the most injured teams were winning. You, like this team's decimated. and But nobody knows who the guys that are playing are. Are they good? Maybe they're good. So I, 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 it was a big issue. But what I said going into that game was Washington, uh, the, the, the Bengals defense needs one stop during the game. One. And I think we're good. And they got zero. But the thing, the thing that I missed is what I was talking about earlier with the bet splits. The Bengals early in the week and throughout the week, we're getting 91% of the cash bet on them. If you hit 90 and the line went from seven and a half um, – or it stayed at seven and a half. It didn't didn't, didn't change to, to to stop that flow of cash. Now on game day, it went down to seventy six because money was flooding in on Washington on Monday. Of course, the picks are due on Saturday. But that's the that's the lesson that I learned for that from that is when I'm doing Survivor, I've got some things where I'm eliminating teams, ninety percent of the uh, cash and tickets, just get them off the list. If a bunch of people win on it, fine, find another winner and move on with my life. But but don't risk. That uh, I think it's just if, if I think if if books are willing to not move the line and take money to the point where there's 91 percent. I mean, and that's what they were saying. Basically, we'll, we'll take all the Cincinnati money you want to bet with us minus seven and a half. And so that that was the that was the mistake there. And uh, yeah, I mean, the injury uh, got, stuff is tough. I got caught into it, too. I thought here's another two and oh, oh, and here's another oh and two team that's got to have a bounce back Cincinnati has such a history in yeah. week three after slow starts yeah but and, and really I gotta say even at the end they 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 they, they forced a fumble and Washington jumped on it they that, missed so many touchdown passes and settled for field goals against yeah, and, the terrible Washington defense that they still got over on but yeah. Burrow should have had 400 plus yards and five touchdowns in that game right and I, I think even with the defensive players out, they should have brought more pressure because the, when they brought pressure, good things happened. That McClure, 
uh, catch in the touchdown, uh, the, the touchdown catch in the corner of the end zone was probably by the time the season's over going to be a top 10 play this year. It was awesome. But that's what you you need to make them make an unbelievably awesome play, which they did. But the, the fumble didn't get recovered, which would have been set them up in a good spot. So there's it was but it was one of those games, right? When things it's kind of like the. Bengals Patriots week one people that were knocked out of survivor were like the Bengals dropped the touchdown pass the Bengals got the ball punched out at the one like that's what happens in these games where the underdog is rising and they're 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 just going to get the breaks that go their way which is why I don't want Washington this week I'll say and uh, probably should have Cincinnati this week but uh, I don't know I'm still <laughs> I'm still I'm still burnt, uh, thrice burnt yeah exactly why not uh, I'm like just like we're doubling that's down. the time when you gotta bet them when you give up on them and you're, they're three times burned and you're ready to throw them in the trash, this is the week for Cincinnati. Yeah, I, well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it, but it's uh, a decision I'm going to have to make in the next 24 hours. So, Just like this is the week for the Colts, even though it makes no sense against the Steelers. Right, and, and there's a lot of people I respect on the Colts, so that's another one where I don't think they're crossed off the list. Uh, I think they might have to consider the Colts. Uh, where are they? Nope, the Colts are, uh, are a pickable game, so we'll see if I wind up with that. All right, let's uh, let's do this again soon. And any important well, words? Let's let's see how our picks go, and then we'll yeah, if this we'll works out, if if if, if uh, Michael we'll burn Wilson the tape, if it doesn't if, work out, if Michael Wilson gets hurt in the first quarter, let's not do this again soon. I agree with that. That's a safe bet. That's the best bet. 